I think, is this all working? It is all working. Good. Okie dokie. Well, good evening, all. Hello and welcome to this Arboricultural Association Wednesday webinar sponsored by Still. My name's John Parker, CEO of the association and your host for today. This evening, our guest is Jeremy Barrell, who will be giving us his top tips to beat the scourge of greenwashing, something that was apparently too political to be advertised on Facebook. So uh, there's an interesting sort of ethical uh, barometer going on over there. Before that, though, before we get on to Jeremy, please do say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. Make sure you select everyone when you send your message. Otherwise, uh, not everyone will be able to see it. Use the Q&A button for your questions. Keep it friendly and polite in the chat. A little bit of effing and jeffing last week. A couple of people not very happy. So just think, at the be let's all be nice. Uh, and no spamming of loads and loads of links, please. There's a closed captioning facility should you wish to use it. There's nothing particular, I don't think, for me to update you on today. So I was just going to do a little plug for membership of the association and invite you all to join our tree community and support all of the work we do, including, of course, things like this very webinar. Next week, we'll be joined by Kristen Molderstadt and Olivier Lundertry for Roots, all about Roots, yes. And then the following week on February the 7th, Russell Miller and Jim Chambers will be asking and maybe even answering the question, why do we lose so many street trees? You can register free for those webinars right now. And then there's more webinars to come, which I will tell you about as we go along through the season. So without further ado, a man whose technology is definitely not going to let us down. I am delighted to welcome our speaker for this evening, Jeremy Barrow. Jeremy, over to you. Hi, John. Thanks very much. That's uh, that's quite a... <laughs> I've got to get this sorted out, first of all. And... Uh, uh... It just takes a few seconds, that's for Good. sure. That's it. Now I can see oh, <laughs> now I can see the emojis coming up, which is really good. And I was saying to John earlier on before we came on, we need a few more emoji emojis so that we can add some thumbs down and different uh different reactions. So that might come in time. But anyway, it's a good start. I've got one heart there. Well done. Phew, somebody's crying, that's a bit serious, isn't it, already? Um so uh right. Uh let's just get this going. Where are we? Right. Um, so what's really good, I think, in these uh, talks is there's quite a few people from overseas. So uh, so that's really great to see. And uh, we'll be pleased to have those guests there. So actually, for the content today, I've tried to make sure that I've not focused too much on British only stuff. And so there will be other things that are relevant to you. Um, just to start, for those of you who don't know me, just a bit of a posset history for a minute or so. But I started working with trees uh, for a tree surgeon uh, who was felling uh, elm trees that had died from Dutch elm disease in um, when I when I was still at school. So I was about 14 years old. It was the early 1970s. Um, and uh, I, I then uh, got a degree in environmental forestry at Bangor University, so I do have some credentials. Um, and then in 1978, I started working from uh, started working for the Forestry Commission. And my dad worked for the Forestry Commission as well, so I grew up and I love the Forestry Commission. The reason I'm here is because of the Forestry Commission. So that's our forest service for people uh, overseas, and it's a great organisation with some great people, especially the people on the ground. Um, and uh, in 1980. Uh, I worked for them for two years as a field surveyor in Wales. And in 1980, I started my own business and uh, I became uh, an AA approved contractor. So I was a climber uh, in um, 1985 and continued doing that until uh, 1995 when I became an AA registered consultant and I sold my business. So I was too old to climb, too worn out. and I'm definitely knackered now, so I can't do too much. But uh, and then that was to the present day. So I've been acting as a consultant uh, for for 30 odd years now. And when I first started, I just thought, well, I don't really want to have anybody else working for me. Being a contractor was really hard. But uh, that went out of the window. And now there's quite a few people work for, for our company, which is great. But uh, that's the background to it. Anyway, to show you um, the um, the, uh, the 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 to show you. The, the type of background that I had. This uh, the screenshot that we've got there is Ilex Way um, in Worthing. It's uh, uh, from 1985, one of the biggest jobs that we did at the time. That was one of the first, um, the biggest contracts that was ever given um, at that time. And you can see it's an avenue of Holm Oaks. Uh, and we did 
had to reduce them all, reduce and shape them all. And by some descriptions, that would be topping. And this is the point about showing this is that uh, <coughs> is that. Uh, from in principle, most of my experience or most of what I'm going to say to you today is based on experience rather than books that I've read and stuff like that. Um, obviously, that does influence me. But the practicalities, that's what I'm interested in. And I started off here. And the interesting thing about this is that these trees were topped uh, effectively. You can see the ones on the right hand side haven't got uh, haven't been done yet. The ones on the left have. And that was in 85, 87. We had the first hurricane. Uh, and in 1990, we had another hurricane, a one every uh, 200 year event in three years after that. And very few, none of the trees blew down, a few branches blew off. And that and, and in principle, um, those trees are still there today and we'll see a shot of them today. Uh, and just in passing, because we were, um, hang on, let me just get to that. But we were very proud of that, is that actually Ilex Way was the um, uh, avenue that led up to uh, the Queen Mother, where the Queen Mother used to live. And when she found out about the work that we'd done, we got a letter saying she was very grateful for that. So we're very proud of that. And that was quite good. Um, and then we look at these trees today and, um, and, and there they are. And 40 odd years later or nearly 40 years later, they're still there. They'd been top, you wouldn't know it, and they're doing fine. So it just goes to show that actually, you know, we need to be very careful about the way we interpret what's written in the books. And we need to intelligently analyze the way that we look at things and the advice that we give and how we manage to treat trees. Because nothing's set in stone. Trees have always got surprises. And this avenue really has got some brilliant surprises if you go and see it. So uh, it really is just to illustrate the practicalities of it. Um, now, in terms of uh, when I was in those early days, I had a thirst for knowledge. I was really keen on um, on learning as much as I could. I went on loads of courses and, and really worked hard. And then as you get older and you get more decrepit and you retirement sort of creeps up on you and you just think you might not be around much longer, then what you really want to do or what I really want to do is to try and pass on that knowledge so people don't have to make all the same mistakes that I made uh, in those 30 or 40 years now, or even longer, 50 years that I've been working. So um, what I want to do now and for the next few years, and I'll be doing uh, some of this with the AA and, and some of it abroad as well with other associations, is to try and pass on as much as I can know. We're not charging for it. You'll get it as cheaply as you can. Uh, but we just want to pass it on because it'll be a real shame. I'll be so annoyed if I pop my clogs and, and all that experience is wasted, is not passed on to people that can use it to their advantage. So what I'm going to do today is give you a very, very quick run through of all the things that I think, not all of them, but many of the things that I think really matter and are going to make a difference and help us deal with this scourge of greenwashing which surrounds us. Um, and so in order to do that, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to put I've got lots of references and people will say, oh, well, where's the evidence? We want to see the evidence. Well, actually, there's quite a lot of evidence. You can't have evidence for everything because practical experience counts. But actually, there's quite a bit of evidence. And uh, what I'm going to do is you'll see in the bottom left hand corner, um, there's a panel and that will have the links uh, in it to the, the the evidence where it's relevant. On the right hand side, it's the location and the date, and uh, and, and that's how I'm going to at least try and uh, make that evidence or that information available. Um, if you want to know more, you can go to our website, and the uh, address is there. I'm not really a great fan of social media. I had a good go at it. I didn't really like Facebook much. And uh, what John said earlier on confirms that, I think. Uh, there's a lot of people don't like Twitter either, but I find it's very efficient. Uh, if you use these things to your advantage, then they can actually um, work quite well. And you can try and sort of filter out all the nastiness that sits there. So if you want to find out more about some of the instances or examples I'm going to show, then go and have a look on my Twitter feed, which is there, and also on my LinkedIn feed, and you'll uh, you'll be able to see um, more information there. Um, and because this is a really bizarre thing about these webinars, right? So I'm talking to, I don't know, six or 700 people now, but actually the last one I did um, in May, uh, sorry, it was December um, 2020, 
has had two and a half thousand views in the archive. So actually, a lot of people will see this from an archive and they won't have the benefit of chat uh, and you could the links that go into the chat. So basically what I've done is provided this um, summary of all the links, which uh, Andrew is going to uh, post into the chat for me, because for me to do more than one thing at a time is going to be pretty challenging. So uh, so Andrew will pop that into chat and you can then have a look at that. And actually as well, so you'll see it on chat. The people in the future can read the links off of here, but I'm also going to put it on our website as well in our um, in our um, useful information tab. Uh, and uh, it means that anybody looking at it in the future, and thank you for doing so if you do, can uh, can actually have access to those links and download that document, just go straight to the links. So we're trying hard to be able to pass this on. Um, and uh, just sort of... I. Somerset House is interesting. It's in London. Uh, they 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 have a very they have a very strong environmental uh, feel and thrust to what they do, and they do uh, they do these exhibitions. And this was one that struck me uh, as being really good an installation art for the 2019 Earth Day, and there are other installations as well. But you know that's really true, isn't it? Global warming at work, that looks like a government office and that's what's going on, is they are not working in our best interests as far as I can tell. Uh, they're working in their own best interests in many instances. Of course, that's a generalisation, but this sums it up very nicely and I wanted to just put it up as a starter. Um, and so what? What? how can we sort of green up the green washing that we're bombarded with all the time? And that's something that I want to talk about. Uh, to you today and I, I you know we're talking about urban greening but actually it's all connected trees wherever they are in the countryside or in urban areas still all matter it's all connected up and so what I've got to say relates to managing trees in a broader context so the first um, uh, uh, sort of section of what I'm going to do is to set the scene and it's a pretty grim affair and I don't want to spend too much time on it we all know about it but it needs to be uh, gone through and, and explained um, and then there are plenty of barriers to how we can make a difference, what we can do to actually start making urban greening actually happen rather than being told it's happening and then wondering whether it really is, because I think there's some questions about that. So I'm going to look at what the barriers are, what the solutions are. I've got 12 or 13 different items that I'm going to try and talk through. And I, I I can't give you all the explanations now, the detail. I can only give you sort of broad ideas. And that's the point about the links and why I spent some time on it. Because if you want to find out more about what I'm saying, then there are places that you can go and you can go and do that. Um, and then I'm going to sort of close that down really towards the end. So the bulk is going to be in the middle in this previous one. But my top 10 tips for urban greening and um, and how to make it work. And I've got a really the 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 one the the top one is one. It's original. Nobody's ever seen it before. I've only just got the information and I've just put it into a presentation. So hang on to the end if you want, uh, because there'll be something quite original that you haven't seen before. And it is really interesting as well for people in the UK. But this applies or everywhere that you go um, to try and make it a bit more interesting and uh, a bit more engaging. I emojis are better than when I did it last time, but, you know, it's not too much. Um, we're going to have three polls and that'll be asking you a question and you can answer them and then we can all marvel at the answers and try and explain them. So that'll be very interesting. Um, and then the uh, tedium of, of a routine, I try and avoid those if we can, but I've uh, thought this, um, what's your favourite book needs spicing up. So I've got, uh, you know, a few little shockers, I think, at the end. And uh, so if you hang on right to the very end, then you might see it. But, you know, brace yourself, really. You might not like it much. So um, so that's the overview of what we're going to what we're going to try and cover. And um, so this is the, the cue for Andrew, uh, who's the technician there doing all the hard work behind him. Gosh, yeah, I'm really grateful he's there. Um, and this is the uh, the, the poll. And uh, this is basically, I think I always wonder how many people are on it, who, where you come from and what your jobs are, because we really don't know. I mean, the AA know, but they don't share it. So, you know, there's there's um, information controls, which means they can't publish it. Well, I think they do. Johnny will probably have a go at me now for saying that. But uh, but I think, um, you know, where are you from? Are you an overseas guest? It's great to see so many people from overseas. Um, are you in the UK? And what's your profession? And it's like only a bit of fun, really. So you don't have to worry too much. But um, but it's. Uh, 
yeah well we've got some we've got some uh yeah we got yeah it's quite it's quite interesting isn't it i, I while, while that just finishes and you you all have a go i think this these aa webinar series with the aa are just fantastic um it, it was i did the first one um with um with tony kirkham and um oh, got the name now uh spencer name was i forgot oh gosh i'm so sorry nicholas spence <laughs> nicola that was it yeah gosh it's such a long time ago and uh, i think we had like it was the first one wasn't it john and we had 167 people or something and uh so it's just fantastic that there's been so many anyway i think we can we can probably call it a a, a day on that andrew but it looks to me like 75 percent from the uk and 25 percent. so that's 100 odd people from abroad so well done that's um that's a good effort and uh and then really the top um uh, what your occupations are tree enthusiasts uh tree consultants uh 40 percent of tree consultants tree contractors eight percent well i used to be one of you so uh so i'm disappointed with that and i can't see the rest andrew hang on can i can't scroll down on that but it's still on my screen so uh anyway there you go. Right. Well, I'm going to stop there and just uh, say I hope that was interesting for you. It gives you something to think about. It's good for us that there's quite a few people um, uh, from overseas as well anyway. So um, right, let me just get that going and just see if we can go. Um, so really just to set the scene and um, and uh, just to sort of get into the, the grit of it really uh, in overview, um, greenwashing is the overstatement of green credentials to make uh, a co corporation, a company, an organisation seem more environmentally friendly than they are. And it's happening everywhere. Uh, and, you know, the difficulty for us as ordinary people is how do we sift through the fake news? How do we uh, identify who's really pulling a fast one? And there's something that's even more sinister. First of all, they're just telling lies. That, so the lies, the deceit and the, the, the manipulation is annoying. But hidden behind that is the, the subtler and, and more sinister problem of actually they're hiding the harm that they're doing to the environment and to the place that we live and the harm that they're doing to us. And that is not good news. So that's uh, where we are in terms of uh, just talking about greenwashing. And I want to try and sort of uh, look at trees in detail in a minute, but look at it in overview. Um, and um, and this is great. I was flying back from Europe uh, a few months ago uh, and, and I, you look out the window and this is all that you see. And this is just horrifying. This is big agriculture. It looks nice from a distance, does it? It looks lovely. But these are um, sterile, ecologically sterile, uh, not even ecosystems. They're monocultures uh, full of chemicals poisoning us and killing the countryside and nature with it. And uh, this is what we're up against. We're up against this, this farming policy that destroys the environment, poisons us at the same time. And yet we're being told how great it is and how necessary it is. Well, it isn't necessary, is it, to use every single bit of land to try and produce food? Of course, it matters to a certain extent and we have to have food. But you don't cram every, kill everything everywhere to get that. So I don't subscribe to what we're being told there. And, you know, here we have the close up, the reality of what it is. Chemicals being sprayed. Everything is being killed except for the crop that we want. And we're being poisoned at the same time as well, because those chemicals filter through into the environment, into our food and into us. And that's the reason why we're or one of the main reasons why we're so fat, why we're so ill and why we die sooner than we should do. And, you know, we shouldn't pretend this isn't happening. But of course, they're telling us it's not. And then uh, on a practical sense, you know, if you can't kill it with chemicals, then mow the hell out of it. All our verges, the tidy garden syndrome that we have to cope with. And there's nothing wrong with gardening, but keep it in the garden. And, you know, nature isn't tidy. Uh, it isn't neat. And we shouldn't be trying to impose the rules that we have in our garden uh, which are quite reasonable in a garden, on the wider environment. And that's the nonsense that we're seeing promoted by councils, by people who just don't care. They go home at five o'clock and have got no social or wider responsibilities and thinking and understanding about things. So this nonsense is going on all the time. And it's not just on the land. We're not talking about this today, but our seas are being absolutely destroyed. Uh, all of the ecology is being devastated by super trawlers and mass fishing 
And why the hell should we have to put up with it? But we do. We're being told, oh, it's essential. We need to eat. Well, do we really um, need to eat that badly? That's something to think about. But I can't talk to you about this today because we need to move on and focus on trees. But there are wider problems that all of us need to be thinking about and trying to do something about. And I can't help you with that um, at, at this time. So moving closer to the trees, where is the wool, wool being pulled over our eyes? Um, uh, well, it's happening everywhere. In 2013, Kingston Lacey is a National Trust property. They've got, uh, you can see it there in the distance. And um, they had one of our top uh, uh, heritage trees there, um, which was planted by the Duke of Wellington. It's about 170, well, it was then 176 years old. Um, but the uh, gardeners, uh, the landscape advisors didn't like it much because it didn't fit in with the original design of the building. So guess what? They made up a whole load of nonsense about how poor that tree was and they felled it. Um, and uh, I know that that tree didn't need to be felled because 30 years ago, I climbed it and crown reduced it and pruned it. And I was just horrified when that happened. Now, the link at the bottom you can see is a video um, and an information note and you can find out more about it there um, but effectively what the um, what the what the National Trust said was well it's it's really badly decayed we've got no choice it's 90% decayed across its base and then they put up a picus tomogram that was from another tree so and not only that they put up a video uh, that basically explained all the nonsense I've just been through. So I went down there and I filmed it and I did it as a 15 minute, I did it in one go. And if you look, this is this is the link at the bottom. If you look at that video, you'll see this wasn't the Duke of Wellington Cedar. They fell three. So this was another one. This was one next to it. Um, and uh, at 520, I think on the video, you can see it coming down. So that's interesting to go and have a look at. Um, but that, you know, when we have the National Trust and organizations like that, who we should be trusting, and, and I'm a member, so I'm actually very supportive of these organizations, then we need to be very, very careful about listening to what we're being told and how carefully we scrutinize it. And, you know, for, for a tree that's 95%, that's it, that's the tree. That's the Duke of Wellington cedar that's 95 percent decayed at the base. That doesn't look to me like a tree that's going to fall over immediately. Um, and uh, they had to backtrack instantly, effectively. And they took down the video they have put up as soon as mine went up because it was pretty clear <laughs> where we were. Um, that was uh, 12 uh 11 12 years ago now so it's quite a while moving uh closer we have sheffield you all know about sheffield so i'm not going to spend too much time on it but every tree that's got a yellow ribbon on it there you can see was due was to be felled we have to do it the trees are damaging the pavement there's no other choice well there is a lot of other choice uh and it didn't have to be that way and we had support from chris packham and we've got philip van vassenaar here from canada from uh from toronto he came over and had a look at it as well and uh, and in the end, um, you know, the residents and this is community efforts which really need to be um, highlighted because they did a fantastic job of highlighting this as an elm tree in the background there that was going to come down. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, and yet we were being told there was no other choice. And uh, there was uh, the public inquiry, uh, the independent inquiry, um, which was held last year was absolutely condemning of the council and of Amy, the contractors, and all the people involved in that farce uh, of saying that trees have to be felled because they're causing minor disruption and damage to surfacing. That's not the case, and it doesn't need to be done. So that's the nonsense that we're having to put up with. And then uh, near another uh, 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 little bit after that, Wandsworth again, this wonderful horse uh, avenue of horse chestnuts here. One tree blew over, councillors went mad and said, oh, my God, one tree's blown over. We've got to fell the whole lot. Well, if that's not a nonsense, I don't know what is. And what was interesting about this, I'll just show you what it looks like after the event because they felled the lot. Um, what's interesting about this is I went to one of the meetings. I went there as a guest, so I couldn't say anything. And what I heard was the biggest load of nonsense and misinformation and manipulation by a councillor that I ever heard. In fact, I went out. I just didn't know what to do. Um, I couldn't say anything, uh, but I was there. So I heard it. I heard the greenwashing. And there was no need for these trees to be treated in this way. And yet the local politicians did it. And then we get, you think, these things, you know, they should have learned, shouldn't they? They should have realised that actually they need to start listening to the people that they're representing. And so we have um, Plymouth here. 
and uh, uh, armored away. And these are some of the trees that are recently fell. They just don't seem to learn. The uh, head of the council had to resign because of this, and quite rightly so. The whole lot should have gone. But this is what we're dealing with. And, you know, oh, the trees have got to come down. There's no way around it. We can't avoid it. Oh, it's so, so difficult. We're so upset, but it's got to be. Guess what we're going to do? I tell you what, we'll plant, we'll take down 100 trees, and we'll plant 200 new ones. Well, that makes it all right, doesn't it? I think you come to your own view on that, but that's the nonsense and the greenwashing that we're being fed with. The drivel that comes out of these local politicians is staggering when you hear it. And there's another picture of it there. So what we have is a thread here of what's going on. Uh, misleading public consultations, local politicians, cherry picking expert reports. For the Wandsworth one, there was three reports from experts that were saying these trees don't have to come down. But guess what? They didn't bother to take any notice of it at all. They just picked out the sentences that suited them. And that's really what greenwashing is all about. It's manipulation, it's deceit, and it's uh, some individuals furthering their own best interests at the expense of the community that they're meant to be supporting. And uh, it just goes to show that not all, but, but many local politicians just have got away with it in the past so they think they can keep doing it again. And that's where we are, is politicians who are meant to be representing us, representing communities out of touch with what the communities want. And uh, just to give you an idea um, why councils and local politicians matter, uh, the link is below for the stats, so you can go there and see. It's not my stats, um, but local planning authorities are important because they influence more than 30% of U UK emissions. So that's why what councils do makes a difference, and that's why it's worth us putting some effort into it. And uh, of the um, nearly 400 councils, and is obviously open to um debate on exactly how many there are because it, it changes quite a lot but 82 percent of those councils have declared a climate emergency and many uh, others or some others have declared a nature emergency as well and so on the face of it, you think oh, wow that's good yeah these people really do care about the environment but is the words or are the words being matched by the actions and that's what we need to look at so that's uh that's uh that's my take on the, the the background to it and just to try and see that's just my take on it so it's just what i think and uh, and it would be very interesting to see and hear what you think so so have you know you know we're being told well we're doing a good job of urban greening gosh we're planting this many trees have you as an individual in your neighborhood um seen uh, a lot of difference a lot of change or have you seen some uh, or have you seen very little change no change at all or you think it's actually getting worse um and um i've obviously you know it shouldn't be necessarily um, my view that dominates although i'm presenting here so it will be interesting to see what uh what the poll says and we're getting yeah, well, we're nearly, you know, well, there's a few more. I, I think more people join as we go along. So, so the, you know, 450 at least. And, uh, yeah, so that's pretty good. So, all right, what we'll do is Andrew will decide when that, when that, um, is finished. But I think uh, quite clearly, um, very few people are satisfied with the progress. Some are. And in fairness, there has to be, you, there are some places that are doing a great job and they are really working hard and making a big difference. So this doesn't apply to everyone, but there are many places as, um, as this show and shows and, you know, very little change, 25%, some change, but plenty of scope for more, no change at all, um, 16% and 28% are saying it's getting worse. Um, you know, those aren't good figures. That reflects pretty much what I've been saying. I've probably had some influence on the result there, but I think it means that you know, I'm not beating a, a hollow drum here. I think what I'm saying is what we all know uh, and uh, just putting a spotlight on it, really. So um, so that's where we are in terms of um, of that. So that's interesting. Thank you for that. It's just interesting to uh, hear what, uh, what people are saying and what people think. So the next part of the talk, and I've got about half an hour left now to try and give you quite a lot of examples so i'm going to speed through them so you will if you want to find out more about individual things then please um use those links 
Um, and I want to try and finish on time. I, got, I was just staggered. I, David Lonsdale finished on the nail, literally an hour. And then Sir Harry's dud home last week, he had to shorten his talk by half an hour. And he still finished on time. And you would never have thought that that he was stressed at all. It was brilliant. So he did a marvellous recovery from that. And I'm not going to be able to um, match that, I don't think. But anyway, let's let's have a go at it and see. Um, what are the barriers to uh, and solutions to urban greening? What are the things that are not working very well? What can we do as individuals to try and um, to try and uh, improve things? Let's just get on to that. Um, but as a starter, is what I've been saying true or is it just, uh, you know, and I'm just hyping it and I'm just trying to hype up the greenwash? Well, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the State of Nature um, was published uh uh last year the end of last year and it was 60 something organizations these are these are really responsible organizations that all came together and effectively identified and this uh covered the whole of the environment as well including uh the, mar- the marine environment and um and uh the um that identified that one in six species uh around all over is at risk of extinction that is just a, hun- a horrendous uh situation um, and so we know that, that there's something bad, wrong, and all of the research, or the, most of the research, or certainly significant research, is proving that that's the case. And then literally, just a few days ago, um, the Office for Environmental Protection, which is a government <laughs> agency, uh, published this document. And it's long, uh, it's nice, got a nice cover, so it's worth looking at it, uh, and you can download it from the link, but Progress in Improving the Natural Environment in England. So they basically report on the progress of government. And I don't like putting text up much, but I thought I just need to put this a couple up and I'll read it as well, is that this was one of the main parts of their conclusions. But the report was damning. It was absolutely condemning of the government and the failure to deliver on its promises. And I'm just going to read you these few bits. We concluded that that progress in improving the natural environment over the year under review had fallen far short of that required to realise the government's vision. Look, the government have got they they understand what's needed. I think that everybody accepts that. But actually, the massive gap between the aspiration, what they want to do and what they're actually doing is just staggering. Um, and it's just then it's not making any difference. So uh, or very little difference. So that's the first thing that it comes. And then just another part. And this is the last bit. We urge government to change gear immediately to provide more, bigger, better and joined up habitats, to protect and restore species and with an estimated 70 percent of land in agricultural use to incentivize farmers to maintain good stewardship of the land they occupy. Look, the farmers aren't to blame for this. The, the people to blame are governments that set the policy that say we want production at any cost. And that cost is an absolute destruction of nature. And we are going to pay a heavy price if that is not reversed and immediately uh, and, it, and they work on it. So that's where we are. This is the government's own advisors. And so please don't tell me that this isn't relevant or we shouldn't be taking any notice of it. And, you know, I want one of the things if somebody said to me, Barrel, what, you know, out of all your years, everything you've done, what's going to be? The, the best clue or what's the thing you've learned that's been most useful to you and it's a simple thing and what I've seen is as many of you will have seen it is developers and councils going oh it's only a couple of trees it doesn't matter and I was there so I was a contractor felling these trees and then oh we'll plant some new ones well the new ones die or they don't get planted because you know for a whole range of reasons we're not here to talk about that But what happens is you lose a tree here, you lose a tree there and you lose one over there. And you know what? That builds to a massive decline in urban canopy cover. And that has an adverse impact on all the people that live in towns in many, many ways. And uh, this is just a classic example. And you can see that had 117,000, sorry, 137,000 views on Twitter. Uh, so people really felt that that was something that was quite important. So you can have a look at that on Twitter and see what you think yourself. Trees gone now. There's three other trees uh, been planted there. Of course, oh, great. Guess what? <laughs> we have felt that big tree and we'll put three little ones in and they won't make it. They're cherries or whatever. Um, so uh, this is this is what I've seen. And, you know, the good news is that it works in reverse, is that Although you lose a tree here, you lose a tree there. But if you gain a tree here and one there and one there and one there, do you know what? All those little things build to a big result. And that's really good because on the face of it, 
from the devastation and the things that I've shown you that you'd think, oh, my you know, goodness, we can't make a difference here. Well, we can make a difference. We can bypass these people that are not representing us properly and we can start doing our own things. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute about what we can do. So what I've noticed is that one small gain here, one small gain there and one small gain over there can actually build to a really big result. So it means that it's not hopeless. We're not useless. We're just little people. But if we all do little things together, then actually that builds and builds and builds. And that is really positive because it means that we're not wasting our time because you could be absolutely driven to give up. And some people do give up. So I'd urge you not to. Um, uh, there's hope yet. We're not past the point of no return. We're getting close to it. Um, so uh, a, a few strategic things, first of all, <clears throat> on what we can do. Documentation is critically important. I'm a trustee of the Trees and Design Action Group. We don't make any money. I don't get paid for it. We're just a charity. We just basically, uh, we don't have paid membership. Uh, we basically uh, get together as a group of us, me, Keith Saker, Sue James, um, uh, Anthony Hollisall and um, and uh, blah, 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 Sue Illman. And, um, and we uh, talk about how can we make a difference? What can we do that will help people do their jobs better, help them argue the case for better environmental stewardship. And we come up with plans and we've come up with a whole range of different things over the last 10 years. And, and I wasn't involved in all of them. Um, and then basically we get the idea, we work it through, we get the finance and support from from supporting colleagues. And, uh, and then we get the thing done and we publish it. And guess what? We publish it. It doesn't cost anything. So people who really need this information, first of all, it's current. So we have um, our researchers go out and they look at it. They get paid to do it, find out what's going on, speak to the people on the ground, put it into a document. We publish it and you get it for free. That's the way to get information out there, because that's what we need, because none of this is secret. None of this is hard to do. We've got the technology. We know how to make a difference. It's just that you can't get hold of it. You can't find out where it is. And uh, and that's the problem that we've got. So the Trees and Design Action Group have a whole range of publications, and I'm not going to go through them, but you can download them from the website. They're all free. Some of them are translated into other languages. And we these are the ones which we've done so far, the latest ones, Trees planning and development uh, first steps in urban water and we're looking at a canopy cover um, one at the moment as well all of these things are designed to help you put pressure on the people that say oh no it can't be done can it no this is too difficult and because actually it's not that difficult because what you find is if you go into trees um, and hard landscapes there's 20 or 30 case studies in there where people have done it so if you can stick that in front of someone that says, no, no, you can't do that. And, and you can say, well, hang on, we can't do it, but they did it over there. So why can't we do that? Then that puts them under a lot of pressure. And that is a very important um, uh, way to make a difference. Um, and then you compare that to the British standard, this archaic uh, approach of disseminating information. And um, just to take an example, trees from nursery to uh, uh, to independence in the landscape. Um, I worked on it with Keith Saker and a whole range of other people as well. And we produced a great document. Um, and that's that document. Guess what? If you want to use it, you've got to pay 314 quid. That's pounds to people. Not in that slang for pounds. It's quite a lot. Like it's a lot for a book that... Everybody contributed. All the experts contributed without fees. They wrote it without being paid to do it. And they put that information in there, critical information. And we'll look at some of that later that people need. And yet you have to pay for it. You cannot put that into it's copyrighted. So you can't put all of it, all the relevant bits in not some of them. You, some of it's exempt, but you can't put that into a specification and start making a difference on the ground. Different, isn't it? It's quite interesting. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. Something to think about. Um, design failures. I mean, it's just staggering when you see the rubbish that's produced by so-called professionals. Um, this is one. I mean, I just was driving past and I saw it and I, was thinking, I can't believe that. I mean, you just have to look a little bit closer. Um, and uh, that is like amazing, isn't it? It's mind boggling. First of all, somebody got paid for it. Secondly, someone thinks that's being professional because that's part of their job. They delivered it. And thirdly, there's a council that said, yeah, that's OK. That's good. Do you think those people are working in our best interest? That design is 
you could say it's innovative and it's creative and it's lateral thinking. I just think it's idiotic. I think it's just, you know, it just isn't impressive, is it? I mean, you can form your own view. But 137,000 views on Twitter as well actually came to the same conclusion. So that's interesting, isn't it? Um, and then we have this. Uh, we have landscape architects. There are not all of them, but some of them are fantastic. But, you know, a lot of them, they seem to live 30 or 40 years ago where they put a tree in because it looks nice. Well, that's fine. That's a good start. But, you know, we're in a canopy and nature crisis. We need to be planting trees that are going to produce big canopy to buffer the heat, to collect the pollution, to buffer the rain fall. And, you know, we have we see this stuff time and time again. That's a rowan. So a rowan is a sorbus area. Um, for those uh, our overseas guests, it goes to about five or six meters tall. They can grow bigger and, you know, but you could have an oak, you could have a large canopy tree there. And yet that's what we get. So, again, you know, and then we have this issue of, well, you know, can, uh, avenues of single species trees. They're fantastic, aren't they? They're great landscape features. Well, they are. And sometimes it's absolutely justified to to have them. But, you know, what we should be doing is we are in a climate crisis. We're in a we need to make sure our planting is as resilient as it can be. And the way to do that is to get lots of different species in. This is a great example. So this is a positive uh, example um, that I saw up in Grantham in 2019, where there's three different species in this in this avenue. I think it's cherry. I think I can't remember now. Sycamore. And it, no, I can't remember what the other one is anyway. And they just planted them all three and then repeat them and repeat them. So if one of those trees gets a disease or, you know, like um, like ash dieback or something like that, uh, that kills all of the ash or all of the one species. Well, if it's a single species avenue or feature, you've had it. In this one, you've got a chance to recover it. So excellent work there um, uh, up in uh, Grantham uh, and uh, really good to see. But then, um, you know, tree planting failures. I want to talk about that if I can, because I see this everywhere. I mean, do you can you see that little tree there? I mean, does that really need a stake that's like strong enough for Oh, well, I wouldn't be able to break it, would I? I? I mean, it's huge. And when you see these fools that are in doing that and delivering that, you just have to think, really? I mean, this is this is National Highways. I don't know if they actually did it, but this is a National Highways project. It's a Lewis um, cycle uh, path. It's a great, great thing. But the landscaping is appalling. Just go onto my website. Oh, sorry, not onto my website. Go onto my Twitter and, uh, uh, and my... Um, LinkedIn feeds, and you'll just see the nonsense that's going on here. And uh, it's just unbelievable that people are being paid to deliver this sort of second rate, poor quality uh, work. And this is so this is it. This is another one. Right. So I've got, I've got some great videos of this. So video is good, but I wouldn't it would never stream on here. First of all, look, are trees meant to curve like that? I mean, are they really? Is that a joke or what? And then you get I'm going to get a bit closer. Guess what? Those those ties, all you need is a little pin, a little nail, that, that or even a stapler. And you just tap it on there and stop that, that stake moving up and down the post. And if you don't do it, what happens is the wind blows, the tree rubs against the top of the stake and the tree is finished. I don't need to say much more, do I? But these jokers are being paid to do it. And we've got national highways overseeing it. And, and you know, well, they should be ashamed of themselves. And that's not fair in, in a broader sense, because actually National Highways do a fantastic job on our chunk roads, but they lost their way on this one. And somebody needs to look at that because it's appalling. Um, and then we see, um, you know, developments uh, all over the place. But this is in the summer. So you can see dead trees. We see them all the time. There's a whole load of reasons. But, you know, if you've got a tree and you it's not staked properly, then that's quite, you know, that's quite innovative, isn't it? But it's not very good for the tree, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but, you know, this is the type of nonsense that we're seeing and people are being paid to do it. And then this is another one. I was up in Grantham. So I went to see the Woodland Trust. I, I like the Woodland Trust. And um, and I popped into this this estate just down the road and blow me down. Look what I found on the face. Of it looked quite nice, except it's summer. And uh, and then you get a bit closer. I can believe it. I was thinking, well, what's that bark falling off for? And I thought it was a stake, first of all. But no, it wasn't. Uh, all the trees were dead. Laughable, isn't it? And people are being paid to do this. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, you know, going back to the BS as well, Trees from Nursery to Independence in the Landscape is a great, great document. It's got a, got a lot of good content from the best people around at the time. 
um, and it's it's presented in a creative way. You just have to pay to get it. It's got a table one in there, and you can look at that. Uh, and it, uh, you don't read it, of course, no. But um, but it's, uh, because it's copyrighted, I couldn't put a copy of it up. So what I did was summarised it. So uh, so just so that I don't break the law and I'm not doing anything illegal, it's su it's a summary. All right, uh, we wrote it. They copyright it. They get paid to uh, produce it. And guess what? Nobody buys it. It's never used. And this is one of the most powerful documents that you could use to make sure that the people that deliver the the rubbish trees that are being grown by many, many nurseries, and I see them every day, to send them back. So you specify this table should be observed, and if they don't comply, you send it back. That's the way to make nurseries start to, to make a difference. So, you know, these are simple things, but just try it and see. And then another thing which I've noticed, and it, well, in fact, it wasn't me that noticed it, it was... Um, and Jalizo, when she wrote uh, Trees in Hard Landscapes and Sue James as well um, for TDAG, and uh, is that, you know, a lot of these initiatives that happen are by local champions. So they're local people that are enthusiasts. They're, they're, they're just ordinary people, but they do extraordinary things. And this is in Hackney. So I went up to Hackney, me and Keith Saker went up there and had a look. And this is Rupert Bentley Walls. He's a tree officer. He was. He's not anymore. And um, I don't think he is. And um, he, he might be on. Um, and uh, but Rupert had this really worked hard to try and get these uh, streets pedestrianized and then fruit trees planted along them to try and give something back to the community, make them proud of the environment that they were living in. So this idea of champions uh, to, to, to move things forward is really, really important. And, and you see them all over the place. And uh, here we've got Rob McBride. Uh, this is the Bremen Oak um, in Newtown in Mid Wales. And they bent a road. Uh, they were going to cut it down. And his campaigning, and this is Mervyn, the farmer. I think that's Mervyn, uh, the farmer who was there. Uh, but he, um, he, uh, he, he managed to get enough support to try and keep that tree. So an excellent effort. And, um, and you know, Rob, it's just a store. It's just an ordinary guy like me and everybody else watching this, but he's just made a huge difference. And he actually, so I was really envious when I saw this because I have one from, from Clarence house, I think, and uh, from the queen mother and he had one from the queen. So uh, good on him. That's an excellent effort. And uh, that's great recognition for a great job. And his current, um, uh, uh, hobby horse that he's on is trying to protect this must be 500 years old. This is a big Oak. It's uh, called the Darwin Oak. It's up near Shrewsbury. And uh, it's a huge, huge tree. I haven't seen it, but I'd be love to get up there and do it. And there's a petition at the moment which you can uh, which you can look at at the bottom, and um, hopefully, uh, you know, help support him. Try and uh, make sure that that tree is retained. It should be retained for as long as it can be. Uh, and it's got the potential. It's 500 now. It's got the potential to be able to go another 500 years. Easy. You just have to keep pruning it or let it fall apart. But don't put houses near it, and don't put a road near it. Um, and then this is just from the um, from Alison uh, White, who's just an ordinary person. Again, I haven't met her, but I've seen her um, on the TV uh, doing things. And she's just done a fantastic job of exposing the incompetence uh, that sits within uh, councils and local politicians that think they can get away with hoodwinking, pulling, uh, filling, you know, just pulling the the uh, blinds over um, over the public and just not listening to what they're saying, but saying they are. So good on her. She's uh, it's worth looking at that uh, website and to look at some of her interviews there. One of the things that's um, that's really uh, um, that's really, I suppose, been missed in the past. It's not anymore because the BS BS five eight three seven has been updated. And hopefully, there'll be a bit more hedges. It is hedges how important they are? And I used to think well it's just a hedge you know but actually some of them are hundred well many of them are hundreds and hundreds of years old and they are ecologically so rich that until you start you know i just used to see birds and i start i like birds now and I, i'm not like a birder but i i it's wonderful when you see them they're a good indicator of the quality um, of the environment and they live in hedges they love it and then you you realize then how much ecological value there is and this is still going on this was last year so this was a photograph sent uh, it's in Wales, unfortunately, because I'm from Wales. So um, that's a bit disappointing, isn't it, really? Um, and, um, and you know, this is what 
farmers are getting away with not all of them but some of them are and this is just this is wrong this 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 is something that we should be trying to address because hedges are critically important and this is uh twitter uh, a photograph i put in was a video i put on twitter and that had over 400,000 views so that's not insubstantial and the reason why is because in the spring these are hawthorns so if you look at it on the right hand side we've got this bank of flowers and nectar on these trees that on this hedgerow trees that haven't been flailed or cut for three or four years on the other side we've got a hedge that's been regularly cut and you can see the difference can't you when you look and that's what why hedge management needs to be looked at of course you can't do it everywhere but some places where there's a verge like this you could leave your hedges for say three years and do a third every year and then over three years you have a rotation and then what you get then is when you look at it you see you've got nothing over there virtually nothing and look at the berries that i mean it's a good year for hawthorn but look at the fruit on there the food for birds and small mammals is just staggering and uh, that's just about management understanding the importance of them and they've also got other important uh, elements as well which we can talk about um, so this is in Singapore. So that's what it doesn't matter where you are. The same thing happens. Singapore were visionary in their understanding of the need for green infrastructure and to make their places green. So they're nice for their residents. And they do. They have one of the highest densities of uh, buildings and people in the world. And yet they have some of the best green infrastructure that you could ever go and see. So if you get a chance, go and see it. And here's just one simple example. The roads have got hedges between them and next to them. And do you know what that does? Because most of the pollution or a lot of the pollution from roads is in that top one to two meters. It collects and buffers the pollution and stops it growing and blow, sorry, blowing over onto where children at one meter breathing air at one meter, one and a half meters in height are walking and people are walking. Easy things um, to do and really quite easy to maintain as well. As well. And yet the air, all the way you hear, oh, no, we can't do that over here. Oh, no, the costs will be too great. Oh, no, you can't do that. Well, you can. You just need to do it. And um, anyway, I've got. Uh, a few more um, things to go through. I really want to show you if I can. This is an example, a great example of a community initiative that make a difference about hedges. And I can't spend too long on it. But if you just go to that video, you can watch it. It's um, it's a, um, a CPRE, a Council for the Protection of Rural England, award for this hedgerow scheme, um, which had a number of elements that we'll just look at. And if you go on to the Tree Council website, because they uh, oversaw it, you'll have this you'll see this excellent um, flyover and the 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 uh, the aspiration to be able to show new hedges in red uh, where there was no hedge, uh, a reinstated hedge where there was in yellow. And you can fly around. I can't show you here, but you can fly around the whole valley um, and you can look at what it was like in the past. You can look at the new hedges that are being planted and they're going to do it and they're going to have flyovers over the next uh, two or three or four years. So you can see in real or in real time, you can see what the differences are at all the locations. And they're actually having a biological um, uh, baseline data collected. So they're trying to identify what species are present in a whole range of different ways and then they'll compare that to the future so some fantastic initiatives going on here and it's just about reinforcing and um, improving existing hedges where they've started to fail and this is what it looks like so it's just people you know ordinary people nice people neighbors that sort of thing that that are retired and you know or don't have anything to do and feel they want to get out into the air and do it. And that was what it was like before. And that's what it looks like afterwards. So they have people showing them how to do it. Great, great initiative. And here's all the volunteers as well. Everybody in the community or, you know, they don't get paid to do it. They just come and do it and they do a fantastic job. And uh, what's interesting is that is that on the right hand side, we've got all the supporting partners. So the low uh, tree council, we've got network rail have financed a lot wild new forest and uh, new forest national park but it's a local community because they're the ones that drove it and guess what they had a champion and here he is colin andrews um he's in new zealand at the moment so uh i hope he can see this at some stage but you know i've noticed in my life that you you know people that like chickens um are, are quite special and you need to be very careful with them. So I was always really pleased that, that I was um, very polite when I when I spoke to him and I saw this photograph recently and realised that he was a chicken lover. And uh, 
I, I'm not into chickens that much, but but I am into ducks. I've got a pond at the end of my garden. I dug it myself. It's huge. And um, we've our ducks are on it. And I like ducks a lot. But I can't talk to you about ducks now. I, I, I'll get I'll get lost and I'll get into trouble. Um, so so that's about hedges. All right. So this is planting of open spaces. So I want to do something. I'm fed up. The council are doing nothing. Well, what you do is you go out and have a walk around and see where you might be able to get a tr get some trees in. So you can't put them where there's surfaces that easily. But do you think that bit of grass there is full up with surfaces? I don't think it is. I don't think the council are bothered. Do you know what I mean? I don't think the council are bothered. I don't think the highway authority are bothered. I don't think anyone's bothered when they should be bothering. So why don't you go and identify those and then start talking to people and try and get things done? And here's an example from the Bexhill Environmental Group. So it's a small village in an um, old town in, um, in East Sussex. And this was just an open piece of ground in front of those bungalows there. And uh, they uh, spoke to all the stakeholders, uh, which included East Sussex Highways and the local uh, people that live there. And they all agreed, yes, we'd like that to be planted up a tree. So this is what it was um, two years ago. And this is the same view, just a little bit closer. And that's what it looked like um, uh, at the end of last year when I went down there to look at it. So fantastic job. And this is another view. So you can see the houses in the background. They give you a reference point. And um, and that's what it looks like now. So this can be done. Anyway, I've got to speed on now. I'm going to be probably um, a few minutes over time. But I did ask John to start with if, he, if he'd forgive me if I was. So I hope you can all bear with me. Anyway, um, uh, how do you plant into hostile, difficult locations? Soil cells. This is uh, Green Tech now uh, called the Tree Parker. But it was um, when it was Rekin were promoting it as uh, as um, Tree Bunker. And this is the uh, the uh, the view of the installation of the video that did the promotional video that I did. And that's what it looks like now with those tulip trees in there. Great, great effort. And uh, it really works well. Um, 2007, I was over in Redwood City uh, and I met uh, Julian Ray. He is uh, the owner or was the owner of um, Deep Root. And he, his a daughter's house, he was putting in one of the first silver cell installations. And, and here it is. I saw it. And uh, this is it now. And uh, the tree on the right um, has uh, has right, isn't a silver cells. The tree on the left is not, and you can see there's a significant difference between how much they've grown. Um, and uh, and then just uh, to try and be fair to all of the providers, Deep Root also provide products. Uh, their silver cells, and we had some trees uh, at the Bomber Command Memorial, which we oversaw in 2011, 12. There's the cells in the ground. You can see the services running between them. And there's the tree that we craned in and put in there. And this is all um, supported cells, which uh, those trees, uh, uh, there's two in the front. It, that's what it was like just after it was planted when the Queen opened it. And uh, that's what it's like um, uh, last year. And it's a case study that's in uh, trees and art landscapes as well. So uh, we can get them into tough places. Um, Howard Gray from Green Blue Urban told me one of their oldest plantings is in St. Paul's Cathedral, 2006. So uh, so that's um, nearly 20 years old now. And those trees are looking pretty good. So GBU have got some great products, um, but also uh, the Stockholm uh, tree pit. So you go to Stockholm. I've been there three or four times now and I've seen this stuff firsthand. So I'm not talking to you uh, in an uninformed way. And uh, basically, the trees are planted in stone, uh, which is then backfilled with soil and biochar and, and other things. And uh, and this is what it looks like. Here's um, what the installation looks like. Here's uh, some trees in 2008 that were planted in 2004. So they're just getting going. You can see um, that they're quite substantial. And here they are now. Uh, in, uh, 20 odd years later. So so the Stockholm soil mix works as well. In fact, some of the best tree growth that I've ever seen on new trees has been over in Stockholm. So if you get a chance, go and see it. And again, that's a case study, not this street, but uh, there's case studies on that in trees and hard landscapes. And then um, just to get to the practical things, and I just go, I am going to go over um, a five or 10 minutes and uh, because I just think these are really important things to say. Um, it's just easy, isn't it? You know, I mean, I used to do this stuff, so I know what it's like. It's dead easy, isn't it? Just to fell a trunk like that and get rid of it. And, uh, you know, what you're doing is you're just ruining standing habitat, deadwood ecological habitat, which is some of the most scarce and valuable um, habitat resources that we can have. Uh, and it's just lazy, it's uninformed, and it's not necessary. Uh, and in fact, felling should be the last resort. And I did a little video here, which you can look at it. 
um, about tree pruning and you can see really what we should be trying to do with these old trees is just keep them alive for as long as possible to have a slow lingering death so we just want them to just have a few little live branches on them to keep them going not everywhere but you know where you can and you then get this abundance of life on them so have a look at that video if um if you want to find out a bit more about that and then i was in um Windsor Great Park, that's uh, Alex Saitel from uh, from Philip Van Vassenau's company. He was over visiting uh, in 2018 with Keith there, you know, leaving trees like that. In the past, I, I, it makes me feel bad now. Sometimes I think about the things I felled, uh, but we didn't know much better now. But people do know better now, and there's no excuse to fell a tree like that uh, without thinking carefully. And then you go to uh, around the world. So I was in Pune and in uh, India in 2019. Um, speaking at a conference there and I just walked down the road into a local college and saw this stump that was left there so fantastic you know there are people out there that are doing great great things and it would be just dead easy wouldn't it to take that down um, and when you have this is RHS Wisley one of our showcase uh, in, uh, places um, you know world famous and when you see places like Wisley leaving dead stumps and using them as um, interpretational material and uh, RG uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh and Kew do the same as well. When you see these stumps being left, then you know um, that there's something in it, uh, in these sorts of places. So this is not this is not fringe stuff anymore. This is mainstream uh, and we should all be thinking about it. So tree equity, uh, I want it with the Woodland Trust. I'm not going to spend too much about this talking about this. But I'm going to give you a couple of quick slides. This is a fantastic resource. I just was staggered when I saw it. Um, uh, Catherine Nutchins um, was from the National Trust was um, was explaining it in a seminar a few weeks ago. And basically, you can zoom in to your own. Uh, you can zoom right in. This is zooming into Westminster and the color uh, gives you a score of how many trees there are and where you need more trees. So the greener it is, the fewer trees you probably need. And if you want to make a difference socially uh, and uh, uh, and uh, from a diversity point of view, then go to those orange colours and see if you can uh, get the trees in, get trees in there. And then you'll start to make a real difference to people on the ground. So this is just something that you ought to know about. Go and have a look yourself and see whether you think you can use it. And then you know, this is what we should be doing. This is what the aerial shots should be looking like. Water, uh, open fields, agriculture. You can have agriculture. This is not against agriculture. Small woodlands, individual trees, ponds, wetlands, uh, all the stuff that we've done our best to drain, to use, to bring sheep in that live in very marginal environments to try and get a small uh, income from the land. Even leaving heaps of of debris there as eco heaps. Fantastic. This is exactly what we should be doing. This mosaic is what makes the difference. And it's time to start thinking about it. So what can we do? Well, you know, what we've got is we've got a devastated uh, natural environment through farming policy, not farmers, farming policy. This is government policy. They killed the land and they're killing us. And, uh, and we will recover it it will come back and what we've got is we've got pockets of seed areas where pockets of woodland pockets of habitat that all need to be joined up by hedges and then the bits that aren't productive you allow them to rewild and how do you you know what we've got is all of these organizations that you can see on the screen rspb national trust woodland trust um, wildlife trusts have all got bits of land all over the place and what they're doing is managing them responsibly and ecologically soundly and what will happen when we get the hedges and we get enough people supporting this is those sort of little seed areas will start to filter out and recolonize the, the the land that we really shouldn't have used in the first place so there's a lot going on if you can support these organizations that's fantastic so think about that as well and then that's that's the essence of what i'm saying i'm just going to go through them my top 10 tips down from or up from uh, from 10 all the way up um or down actually but um case we, we've been through most of it case studies great way of uh, exposing the people who say no you can't do that well yes you can and here's the proof Proactively challenge highways. We haven't spoken about highways or planning, but they are doing a pretty bad job on the whole and they need to be challenged. They need to be uh, made to be accountable and they're going to have to change their ways if we stand any chance of managing to proactively and substantially improve urban greening. These people need to be challenged. 
identify planting uh, sites and support collaborative community initiatives. You have to get highways in, you have to get councils in, you have to get environmental groups, the local people, get them involved. But that matters. You know, there's a massive resource out there that's sitting, waiting um, to do something, wanting to do something. They just need to be shown how to do it. So that's important. Back to tree equity and to planting design, I can't spend too much. Felling should be the last resort. Don't get rid of these trees. Wow, you know, they've taken years to get to a point where they're starting to deliver the benefits and then they're being cut down. Unbelievable. Landscape architects, if you don't take anything else away from here now, just take these two points away. Species diversification and large canopy trees. You know, that's what we should, that should be your priority. Not every single time, but that should be your first port of call, not the not the lollipop trees planted in the most ridiculous ways, inappropriate species. You know, these people shouldn't be being paid for what they're doing. Insist on 8545 table one. Use that to make sure tree quality is good enough when it arrives on site. And if it's not good enough, send it back. It's there. You just have to use it and then support the organizations that we just saw. This is so important. They are critical um, to providing the way that we can rewild in a quick and efficient way and put right the damage that the last 40 or 50 years of policy has done. Edges really matter. They, I, I feel so bad that I didn't appreciate it early on. And they join up all the fragmented habitat and they provide such a habitat themselves as well. But we should be just making sure that we look after them. Um, and, um, and then this is the one that you won't, or you might know about if you're pretty well informed, but you know, not that many people know about it. Um, but they, you certainly won't have the that I'm going to show you in a minute. So climate change scorecards, and we're going to look at that. So there's an organisation called Climate Emergency UK, and you can read a bit more about it there. And they have this initiative, which is let's assess all the councils in Britain and see how well they're performing on a sustainability um, on sustainability criteria. So that's what they've been doing. They've been doing it for quite a few years. And this year, guess what? Not this year, last year, they published the 2023 results. And that's why I'm going to show you some of the results from that, which is quite interesting. So there's nothing quite like it, is it? You can have, you know, I think it is quite exciting sort of um, um, name and shaming councils or people, you know, is sort of quite good really in many ways but it's a bit negative and I don't like it that much I you know I've met, done some things wrong and I'd rather that I was given the chance to do it right if, if I could um but you know I think that these give an opportunity to name and acclaim and what name and acclaim means is that you basically say well look these people are just right at the top look they've been recognized at doing a great job surely we could uh we could match that couldn't we all get closer to it and that is a very positive way to try and go to people that are decision makers and that can make a difference so have a look at this stuff uh what you get and it's a massive uh enterprise but what you get is a score the councils are assessed on a range of different things so that sustainability Governance, mitigation and adaptation, commitment, creation, community engagement, communications, measuring, setting emissions targets, co-benefits, diverse and social inclusion, diversity and social inclusion. And there's a load of others as well. And this is just an example. So I just happened to speak to Bournemouth and Christ, uh, BCP, Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul a few weeks ago. And it turns out that in single tier local authorities out of 186 that were measured, they're 75th. So not sort of like a disaster but there's a lot of scope to do better than that isn't there um so that's that sort of element to it now what if we go and start looking at the tree parts of that because lots of it was other stuff but they they look at the biodiversity side of things so this is the all the things that they look at peat whether they're peat free pesticides mowing wildlife sites tree cover light pollution green awards green flag awards planning ecologists should be planning our bioculturists. There should be a whole range of other things in there that, that are being asked, but they need some help on this. Um, and if we look a little bit more closely, we can see that question five is about tree cover. And I'm just going to um, uh, read it quickly. Does the council have a target to increase tree cover and is a tree management plan agreed as they grow? And then the criteria will be met if the council has a target to increase tree cover, which is included in the biodiversity action plan or tree strategy, provided the council has agreed tree management plan that details how new trees will be irrigated and cared for. Now that 
brings us to the critical thing is you can plant the politicians are keen on planting you know millions of trees but it doesn't matter what happens to them afterwards the critical part of it so they're getting there but they're not quite there yet anyway this is the bit of information that's really good so on that um question uh five as the council have a target to increase uh tree cover and is it tree management plan agreed as they grow well guess what uh 86 percent of the councils polled don't didn't comply they didn't pass it only 14 percent passed it and what you can see here is the green one so these are the leaders so it's belfast and there and there's that must be uh north of this glasgow there and up there as well and a few in uh the midlands there but you know the bulk of people the bulk of councils are just not delivering so what they're doing is they're talking about it and in fairness some of them are probably working on it but they're not delivering so there's all that greenwashing. So it's the talk and the failure to deliver. And this shows exactly where uh, where they stand. And then when you look at this, in that was just one question. So you look at the biodiversity section. Um, and I'm sorry, biodiversity is spelt wrongly. Um, but you look at that. And if you start to put the councils uh, in there, less than... Uh, the councils have scored less than 10 percent well there's not too many of them thankfully 42 most of them scored sort of 10 to 20 percent in, in in of a full score but you know once you get to 40 percent hardly any um scored more than 40 percent on that on those criteria and those criteria need to be looked at and i'll talk about that in a second as well um and this is just the last slide um to um just as uh, interest to well, not our overseas guests, of course, but to those in Britain. So overall, um, New Forest District Council was the top scorer on the biodiversity section. And that's wonderful for me because I'm in New Forest. So well done. Good effort. Basically, so Dean's just up the road and Devon's down the road as well. Council by types. Um, and you can see there, I'll let you read that. And uh, councils by country, New Forest District Council at the top, Northern Ireland um, uh, will have uh, do pretty well, Scotland um, and uh, and um wales and uh and scotland as i'm sorry in scotland as well so um so that is the that is what you get from that and i don't have time to go into it in any more detail but what we are going to do now is um have another poll so what i'm going to do while that poll and you i'm going to talk to you about the poll in a second and you can be it. Um, but what the um, this is something that the AA could be doing is certainly um, collaborating with um, the climate action scorecards people and start to develop a more comprehensive set of questions about biodiversity and trees. So we should be looking at that and I hope they can move forward on that. And then in terms of me trying to give something back for the living that I've got out of our borough culture, um, I, there's a whole range of things I could do. And in the future, I'm going to be delivering over the next three or four years workshops and more webinars, probably. Um, and there's a range of different things that I could cover. So BS 585, I'd like to be talking about that as being reviewed. I've got plenty of thoughts on that. We've done seven and a half thousand development sites over the last 20 years. So we know what we're talking about. Um, legal cases, I do more legal cases uh, on um, in terms of harm that arises from tree failures than any other consultant in Britain. Um, and I'm quite happy to talk to people about that. Uh, that would be quite interesting. Development site management is a critical area. Um, it's an area where the tree's already there. If we get it right, we can keep trees. And I'm doing a, um, a, there's a conference in two or three weeks time in Chelmsford which um, Sharon Hose, good old Sharon Durden Hollenby now is uh, is producing. I'm speaking there, but we'll be talking about development site um, management there. Uh, canopy cover assessment, with that, we've been working hard on that, so nobody really knows about it much yet, but we're all happy to talk about that at some point in the future. And heritage tree assessment, that's one of the other things I do. I'm speaking in uh, India in uh, six weeks' time. And I'll be talking about heritage tree management there. Um, and then also, I haven't really spoken about tree management at all, but there's lots of practical tree management um, uh, stuff that I've picked up from legal cases and from the practicalities of it. So I can talk about that. And if you don't like the way that I present, then you can go, don't bother. Um, and uh, I that's a risky old business, isn't it? I, I don't even know if I can see the outcome. Oh, well, that's good. Oh, no, one. Oh, one out of. One out of 389 didn't didn't want me to bother. So you just can't keep everyone happy, can you? Um, so that's it, John. I'm uh, 
I'm grateful for the time. I'm really grateful so many people attended and uh, I'm sorry that I've gone over and I, I know I've gone over quite a bit. So fire away if you've got any questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Well worth it. I'm sorry I put don't bother on the survey. I, I, uh, <laughs> it's it's it. so harsh because there was only one person, but it's the one person who can who can make the difference. So I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, some good uh, ideas for future presentations there as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeremy. Now, I just put something in the chat just to let you know. We have got loads of questions and I'm we sure. definitely don't have time to work through them all. I know, I'm sorry. And it's quite all right. Don't you worry at all. But we're definitely going to send them all to Jeremy afterwards, as we always do. And then he oh, great, yeah. That's he good. catches his eye. Um, okay, there's a few people, uh, Jeremy, and I'm looking for who has asked it. Uh, Maeve has asked it, and Richard has asked it. Um, what about biodiversity net gain? Do we think that's going to improve the situation? And then I'll just throw another one in there. This is three questions in one. Someone said, is biodiversity net gain itself greenwashing? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'm not an ecologist and uh, I have an oversight of it. Um, one of the problems that, that planners have to deal with is um, how do you or how do we rationalise um, the tree elements that we look at as tree specialists, arboriculturists in um in um uh in planning terms uh with the ecology of it and, and bng and i think trees you know the, the ecologists have done a great job what they've done is they've got the attention of government and uh they have quite rightly because the environmental matters uh, over the whole country are really important these are just um you know trees are just one small part of uh biodiversity net gain and uh, these produce are much more valuable in terms of the benefits that they provide than than you know they, they're so important they can't be treated um a, a, as part of a bng consideration in, a, in any depth so what should happen or what i think is the best way to deal with this is to have um is to have bng calc so planners are looking at planning submissions what's the impact on the environment biodiversity net gain calculations and assessments is one way of doing it but that's about ecology trees provide benefits way beyond ecology and we don't even know what the values are so about uh you know impact on people's health um and all of those elements and they should be treated uh in parallel with biodiversity net gain and planners shouldn't have a problem doing that and i don't think they will have because what planners do they're the overseers they have the feedback from all the different types of um, uh, specialists that, that feed into the built environment management. And they then balance those and then take a decision and come up with what best suits the, the um, adopted policy. So I think I, I don't I, I think BNG is, is good because it raises the profile of, um, of ecology and that can only be good, but it can't supersede or be instead of. Uh, a proper and full assessment of trees and actually um, canopy cover uh, is is the way to get a better or a more fine-tuned analysis or assessment of what the impacts on a site from development are going to be. So that may be a bit waffly as an answer, and I'm sorry I can't answer it specifically. No, that's great. Thank you. And, you know, biodiversity, again, is something that's going to affect arboriculturists all over the country. I think in some ways we don't necessarily quite understand yet just how much it's going to affect us. And, and the association is no. uh, doing some work on that now as well. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to it's going to be a change. Um, question from uh, Martin um, asking, in your opinion, would additional funds to tree owners help improve the situation? And I suppose I'm not sure if Martin means private tree owners or public tree owners, but I kind of expand that. We've talked a bit about tree officers and everything. And, you know, I'm a big advocate of tree officers, but it's that lack of funding a lot of the time that creates so many problems. So in the public and private realm, is funding the solution? Uh, well, I... <sighs> Well, it's a difficult question. I mean, the first thing is that people, you know, is is knowledge and understanding and trying to educate people. So getting people that, that getting information to people so that they can make an informed decision is really important. So uh, and that's part of the problem is that the information you either have to buy or it's costly or you can't get it. So that's quite, quite important. I think it's easy to say, yeah, just throw more money at it. Um, but tree management doesn't have to be expensive. You just need to do the right stuff, do the right thing. Um, and I think, I mean, sometimes it is, but I don't think throwing money at it is the problem, is the solution. And also when people haven't got much money, it can't be. But what 
we should be able to do is to identify. So, you know, you have a whole range of trees in the population and most of them. So you lose some, you put some in. That's not such a big deal. But really what we do have, and this is the heritage tree stuff, is that some trees are special and they're very special. So there's a real need, important need to identify those and then start to fund that. Because quite rightly, someone... There's lots of tree owners that we see that have some of these heritage trees on their land and they genuinely can't afford to do the management. So they get support from enthusiasts and from organisations um, like the Tree Council and other places and government to some extent as well. But I think identifying the special trees, we should certainly be looking to fund and to look after special trees properly. And then part of that is how to treat them because we've got lots of, well, not lots, because there's some great contractors out there, but there's contractors that just fell in things when it doesn't have to be that way. And uh, we need to be having the vet cert program is a great one so the aa is supporting that but it's a european initiative as well and the more people that can go on to that as contractors to do the practical work and as consultants to do the advisory work the better we will get at identifying these special trees and those special trees are the ones that we should be looking after absolutely thank you and you mentioned about the the importance of making the available uh, the information available free or as cheaply as possible. And uh, you said TDAG quite rightly do some great stuff. London Tree Officers Association, I would also recommend their website. It's got loads of great stuff. And of yeah. course, things like this webinar we try. I, I apologise for smiling during your answer there. I was just seeing that someone's uh, mentioned my new facial hair. And uh, uh, where are we? Uh, uh, Ian's asked where I buried them, which I think is quite, quite... Well, yeah, I, if I just glanced across, I could think that Lemmy was reincarnated from because um, he's, uh, you know, he was just fantastic. So it's a good effort. Anyone that tries to impersonate Lemmy is on my, you know, top 10 favourite books. So uh, well done. Good effort. I was told earlier on I looked like I was either going to join a biker gang or go and solve a mystery in Victorian England. So I tell you what, that's a good, but I tell you what, there's a new Viking series coming up soon <laughs> and and you want to go and see them. If you, you just might need a few more tattoos, we probably can't go there, but. Well, uh, I, I could, t no. <laughs> I oh no. I anyway, we're not here to talk about my uh, exquisite no. facial hair. We're here to talk about uh, other things. Um, and uh, yes, Jeremy, so a couple of people have also asked about root cells you mentioned, and yeah. Naomi's made the point that uh, burying plastic underground may not be necessarily sustainable or can release microplastics out there as well and a couple of people have talked about structural soils being preferable to silver cells have you got any or, or root cells generally sorry other brands are available well i i think first of all using recycled plastic in terms of so you shouldn't use it is a, is a bit of a start i think the um the dutch i've seen some great um uh, well they're not plastic they're concrete and they seem to work as well apple dawn the outside apple dawn station in holland has got um has got some really big cells created from concrete um uh, uh sort of um yeah cages um i think you know i mean there's never there's always you know there's never <laughs> There's never an easy answer, is there? But what I think we need to not lose sight of is that in some places, uh, you know, this the the penalty. It's a case of weighing up the 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 benefits against the disbenefits. And in some places, the disbenefits of having plastic and the potential for that to pollute, and I accept that completely, against the benefits that come from having trees in um, in in the urban environment. Uh, and the benefits that they impart on human health, on pollution buffering, on rainwater buffering, on temperature buffering, uh, you have to do you have to weigh things up. And it's it's like it's like, do you buy a Japanese car or, you know, they they still hunt whales. Uh, they, they commercially hunt whales. And so I really abhor that along with Norway and Iceland. And yet, uh, you know, uh, uh, how far do you go? You you have to you have to. Uh, balance things up and there's never an easy decision so so i think um stock the stockholm mix is great because um you can well i mean it really works um uh but you can use local materials there so you cut down on all the material that you have to import um and certainly in sweden there's lots of rocks so that works quite well um but uh but i think uh, you know there's there's um there's pros and cons to all of these things so i don't think it's a simple answer i think all that we can do is 
set out what options sit there and that's what i tried to do and the different things that you can do and then you then as assessors as consultants as practic practitioners uh, do an intelligent analysis of what's best to use in that particular circumstance. And, and that's tricky because everybody likes to have recipes. You should do this here and that there, and then they don't have to think about it. But, you know, the reality is you do have to think hard about a lot of these things and none of it's easy. So it's not not a very robust answer to your question, but that's it. Right. That's what it's good. Thank you very much. Um, we've probably got time for one more question coming out, so I'm very sorry, but there's one that has caught my eye from Emma, and maybe it kind of ties in slightly with biodiversity net gain, but about off-site remediation, and is that ever appropriate? We hear a lot about, well, we're cutting down these trees here, but we're yeah. going to plant more trees, but we're going to do it miles away or something. That feels to me a very traditional, what I think of when I hear greenwashing, that's the kind of thing yeah. that comes here. Absolutely. That's that's greenwashing heaven, isn't it? That is. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, in some again, it needs each situation should be assessed on its own merits. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the main benefits that come from trees um, are realised when they're I mean, not all of them, but are most of them are realised when they're very close to people. And that's why roads are one of the biggest sources of harm. They provide good as well, but they provide an awful lot of harm. And to get trees in next to roads is really, really important. And to get trees in streets is really important. So the government policy to try and make sure that all new streets are tree-lined is, is exactly what's needed. And this idea that you can squeeze, well, this, this is what they do in America, and we see trees being lost hand over fist in private properties over there because they have very little control over it over that what happens there because the property rights in, in the US are different from over here. But what we're what we should be doing is getting trees close to people and it can be done that's what soil cells do you can uh, and we can get trees in we know how to do it uh green walls green roofs trees uh in these tight urban spaces so you can have both so there is no excuse to say oh no we can't get any trees in here there's not enough space well i tell you i've seen quite a lot of places where you could get trees in and if you don't want big spreading trees then you have fastigia trees and you can get oaks tulip trees birch you can uh, feel maple english trees of course but you know they can all um they can all uh you know be we we can get trees into these environments it's just it's just a greenwash to say no we'll replace them somewhere else yeah absolutely thank you and just one more question i would like to ask because it's a interesting thing that we're going to be doing more about um coming uh soon hopefully but mark's asked about section 115 of the environment act which is the duty to consult of course and that's where uh, local authorities are now compelled to consult with local residents about removing trees unless there's particular exemptions around it quite a bit of sort of controversy in its development uh, partly in response to uh, sheffield as well we've got an article from jim smith at the forestry commission coming up in the next edition of our magazine i think we're going to be doing a bit more about it in the future but I remember, Jeremy, you and I sat on the same table at one of the meetings about the duty to consult. We were both involved in it and in giving information. What do you think about it? How do you think it's going to change things? Well, what happened in Sheffield was absolutely wrong. And what happened in Plymouth is absolutely wrong. And what happened in Wandsworth is absolutely wrong. So, uh, you know, there's examples of local politicians just going way past uh, the ideal of representing the community. And so there has to be, I mean, that change in the law and you've got to give it to the government is that they identified the seriousness of what happened in Sheffield and they reacted to it and you know we can't complain about that I don't think now how it's implemented will be very much you know we don't want to give tree officers and people more work than they really need but we really don't want what happened in Sheffield happening anywhere else in Britain or in the world in fairness that was terrible uh, you know out of 36,000 street trees 5,000 were lost um, and most of those, it was unnecessary to lose them. Uh, so that was just vested interest, incompetence, ignorance, a personal agendas driving tree loss. And that has to be stopped one way or another. And I, I really, you know, you have to hand it to the government that they, that they did make an attempt to do that. And of course, with any type of new legislation, it will take a while to bed in. But I think we need to have the capacity to adjust based on how it works after a year or two and then i think um review it and, and just take it forward um and uh so i think it 
it, it, it's a very it's a good response i think to what was a terrible terrible situation and i was there i saw those trees and some of the ones that were taken down was just it was just criminal really mm-hmm. yeah so due to consult certainly make a difference as well yeah however it goes of course we do need to make sure that the tree officers aren't just overloaded and overloaded with more stuff they need to do and, and you know we, we need to be making sure we're properly using them and um, uh, someone mentioned i think it might have been craig uh, in the chat there about guidance of implementation i think that's going to be included in jim's article in the next hour magazine but i believe there is uh, guidance coming out from the forest commission from defra to uh, sort of uh, help local authorities to implement this this change so i think that is coming but uh uh, we will hopefully get something about that in the next art magazine. Brilliant. It's like it's a, it's a, it's a situation of interpretation. We have the same rules across the country um, for planning. And, you know, some places do wonderful and other places are awful. And it's about local interpretation and how those rules are put into practice. So guidance from, you know, a, a competent body like the Forestry Commission and from DEFRA and from other uh, people would be really welcome. And I think there needs to be the capacity to assess it after a few years and see whether it's done any good or not. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, I apologise to everybody out there who whose questions we didn't ask. I do sometimes have people emailing me saying, I didn't even ask my question. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sure it was a great question. We have just had so many. I couldn't ask them all. Uh, but I do have time for one more question. And it is, of course, the big one. We've been promised some form of controversy. I don't know what it is. But Jeremy Barrell, what is your favourite tree related book? Right. I just I ought to I ought to. Well, Right. First of all, this. Right. I look at that. Isn't that brilliant? The Arb magazine. I tell you, I've seen them all over the world. ISA, um, New Zealand, Australia. They all have magazines. But ours is brilliant because you open a page up and look, there's no adverts in it. So, you know, I'm. Yeah, look, every single page, not every page, but, you know, it's not full of adverts. And I don't like it when I open a book. And I mean, it's not a book, but, you know, it's a magazine, but I don't like it when you just get bombarded with adverts. So that's um, so that's that's really right at the top of my list. I think you do a great job. Um, and uh, Simon Richmond um, and um, gosh, uh, you know, do a great job. I was about to say well, that's brilliant. It's the best dance we've ever had, obviously. And Simon Richmond oh. and Sarah Bryce. Are yeah, the and I haven't. People I, to say well I haven't finished yet, right? You have finished. That's it. You're not getting any better oh, than that. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Have a nice time. This oh, is the God. best bit. This is the best bit to come, right? Oh, on, man, it's man. the document that's done the most harm to our borough culture in the whole uh, of UK history sits here. It's the BS, and I've been through it, and that's it's so expensive, and uh, and it just is a document that we should be ashamed of that we're actually paying to do it. There's two at the top good of my document, though. We're not saying it's not a good document. It's a good document, but it's bad that we can't get hold of it. Is that it's a principle, right? It's a principle. And then at the top of the list, equal top, right? Now, I've got a green screen behind me and the cover of this is green. So the, the camera thinks it's, I don't know, I have to go back. But anyway, it's David's book. Yeah, David Lonsdale's book. Good on him. And this is, you can see, look, mine's falling apart. The pages are nearly out of it. And I have, I use it so much. So David is great. And then my top book, or along with David, equal with it, is this steel manual for, how, for an electric brush cutter, right? And I have grown up using battery and engines that are killing like I'm choking to death my hands are aching I go to bed and I wake up with pins and needles in my arms and these battery this battery equipment provided by steel is fantastic look at it look diagrams anything you want it's just the best book you could ever have now if that's not a good advert for steel what is I, I am well done. I'm blown away by that. I think that's but still look, you got that. We didn't even we didn't even, uh, plan that. Uh, <laughs> amazing. And of course, Jeremy managed to pick three books, well, two books, a manual and a magazine. <laughs> I know. Um, so so of course only Jeremy could get away with that. Thank uh, you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that. It was really, really wonderful. We had more about 650, probably up towards 700 people watching. So it was absolutely wonderful. Right. You still got oh. 500 now. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I, you know, to have people attend is really good. And um, I just hope that they found it useful. And, and I, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry I ran over time and I'm sorry that I had to go quite quickly. But it's such a lot of information to try and get across. So thank you.
it was great and we we are always happy to have you back doing a webinar you know that and you did our first ever one and you will do more for us again in the future. <laughs> and now we've got a list of stuff that people want to hear about which is even better so oh, <laughs> thank you very much jeremy thank all you right. to all of you for watching thank you still of course you get an extra bonus bit of sponsorship today so well done uh, yeah. thank you for andrew for helping and everybody else have a wonderful evening look forward to seeing you next week uh and uh, yes you'll get to see the facial hair again unless i do something different <laughs> all right Thank Thanks. you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks.